Oh, hello. Um, welcome again. I do apologize for me not looking overly fancy. Um, I now have a full-time job and it's really annoying because I do actually have to do work. So, yeah, you could imagine. Um, anyway, I'm just going to go straight, dive straight back into it. Not back, just dive into it. Um, yeah, today's video is going to be probably unedited, by the way, because I genuinely just do not have time. I am so sorry. If someone wants to be my editor for free, um, dressed in a maid outfit, I will happily accept that. Um, but for now, yeah, it's it's a bit hard. Um, anyway, so today I'm, I intended to talk a bit about Russian literature. Depending on the time, I may just do some setup. And then I will, if I have a bit more time, I'm going to dive straight into the book as well. But again, it really depends on um, how we're going to be doing. Because, so what I really wanted to be talking about today was Master Margarita. Um, it's a beautiful book, wrote by um, Mikhail... <sighs> we're doing this again. I have to pronounce the foreign words. Um, in a British way, when I know that Polish people pronounce them differently, a bit closer to what they're supposed to be pronounced, but then I still don't. It's really difficult. Anyway, I think he's like Mikhail Bulgakov. That's the guy who did Master and Margarita. And he had a very exciting life. So we may just focus on Bulgakov in this video and then cover Master and Margarita in the next one. So it's also a bit of a birthday stream because my birthday was... Um, few days ago on the 12th um, and Bulkako's birthday was on 15th of May so just two days ago um, I mean obviously he's dead but you know he died uh, pretty early actually as well anyway so his life story is actually pretty fascinating because he basically survived um, so he lived through the Tsar and then all the revolutions the um, so Russia, in between 1918 and 1919, they had 18 changes of the government, and he lived through all of that. It was really annoying for him, because his family was very... Um, well, his father was orthodox, but he wasn't, um, he was like, extremely fanatical. He was trying to... he really made a point of teaching um, Bulkakov actual, you know, just... He taught him to be open-minded and read a lot. So that's what he did. So they were um, fairly a religious family, um, but they were still fairly level-headed. And as I find that very important because, like, you, I don't know, like, some of you may have seen my video on introduction to Polish literature. So you had a lot of people in, uh, in the 60s who openly just... You had the whole movement. You had people who just joined communists and were like, oh yeah, we're going to happily write for, for the communists. We're going to write propaganda because it's great. It was stupid. And what I really like about Bulkakov is that he wasn't like this at all. He didn't want to... <sighs> he tried. He tried, but he just couldn't do that. He could not compromise his values. It was just literally impossible to him. So... I, I do absolutely admire this man, so I think we should definitely stick to him when it comes to um, talking about rational literature, and I definitely want to start from him. Especially, like, most people would think, like, rational literature, oh yeah, Tolstoy, oh Dostoevsky, oh, those people who always write those very long, uh, very dull, and very grim um, novels. That's not really everything that you get in rational literature. Bulgakov was actually very special, like, he... He took a lot of inspiration from Pushkin, Dickens, um, and obviously Dostoevsky. Um, and you can see the difference. Also, he he loved to dabble in those f fantastical themes, too, um, which made his books just different. And I wouldn't really call it fast-paced, um, but Master and Margaret is certainly eventful. Like, you literally have an oversized cat who's who loves drinking vodka and loves pistols um it just it's just this like weird devil's court clown kind of person <laughs> it's really odd um so there's certainly like a lot of bits that are just odd 
and in my opinion it just makes the book great but that's the thing like um Bulgakov was also kind of kind of a Christian and he did decide to so because of under ugh, we do need some background regardless which I'm going to get to at some point but at the time obviously under under Soviet Union and Stalin um you had a lot of people who like the Soviet Union was strongly pushing for atheism and they really hated the religious people now obviously as I said previously Bulgakov wasn't really fanatical but he was a Christian so obviously he wouldn't really agree with that and you can see those underlying Christian themes in the book as well and I find it very admirable because it's just this was the kind of counterculture at the time he was trying to make things different and he succeeded what's what's also really interesting about um about the guy is that he had this very odd relationship with stalin like they both love and hated each other like bulgakov kind of wanted his respect and his um approval but at the same time he hated him for his pol politics and the stuff that he was doing to stifling free speech and the censorship and such um and then Stalin would allow Bulgakov to not be able to find employment and struggle financially, but simultaneously he would protect him from, um, for example, getting arrested. He was interrogated a few times by um, by the secret police, but he he actually never was arrested, which was definitely something to to be proud of at the time for sure. Um, but yeah. So a bit more about the man, right? Um, he was fairly attractive. If you Google Bulgakov, you'll see that he was actually quite hot. Um, important. Um, so yeah, he was kind of pals of Stalin, basically. Um, but not entirely. It was a very weird relationship, basically. Um, so yeah. He he wasn't only a writer, so he started off, um, he was born to a very fairly wealthy family. So his father was um, an Orthodox Christian um, and he was also a, a thinker, I think. Um, he was doing a lot of stuff. I don't know, I'm going to double check that later. Um, Uh, so Bulgakov was um, not only a writer um, he so his father died quite early on and his mother decided to kind of provide him with the proper education and she managed to do that and she also pushed him to actually go to college and become a medical doctor now Bulgakov was really into writing quite early in life um, so he actually failed his first year um, and then then he passed it but then he had to redo it all over again um, mainly because he was seeing a girl uh, the girl who was supposed to become his wife later on um, but he also he was also um, already very interested in um, writing and journalism so he was doing a lot of that um, but eventually he passed um, all, all of his like doctor stuff uh, with distinction so he was doing quite well um, and that's the thing so his father was a state councillor and um, he was also a professor at the Kiev Theological Academy um, and as I mentioned he was a Russian Orthodox essayist thinker and translator of religious texts so his dad was pretty smart you could say um, and his mother was a teacher so you know a fairly good family um, he so there was this thing of um, so supposedly the rumor has it that Bulgakov's mother was a descendant of Tartar hordes. Um, it couldn't really be verified though, so who knows? But she could have been quite interesting, I'd say. Um, but yeah, so Bulgakov did quite well uh, at school at the start when he was dealing with like literature and other things. Um, and yeah, he praised Gogol and other people. Um, he was also very early on fascinated with the opera so and theatre. So 
even when he was a child, he would write plays and his family would play it out. Um, so that's how he started. And you could already see that interest um, in those things were growing. Um, so yeah, he was... So 1913, he marries the first wife, the one that he was courting, and because of whom he kind of almost failed his um, doctor stuff. Um, I'm just calling it a doctor stuff because I, I, I don't really understand Russian education that well, so just bear with me. Um, so then obviously we had the outbreak of First World War, and then he volunteered uh, for the Red Cross to become the medical doctor. Um, he got very... So, the guy was extremely unlucky, right? Because he he got injured twice, at least, when he was um, when he was at the front, um, you know, healing people and stuff. Um, so, he he had terrible wounds that caused him, like, a lot of long-term effects. So, he got hooked up on, on morphine, because why not? Because he was a doctor, it was fairly easy for him to get it at the start. But then... Well, it was more difficult to obviously get it. So he would basically get his wife um, to to go to like different pharmacies and pick up morphine for him. But eventually, eventually she got very annoyed with him. Um, so rumor has it that he did abandon uh, morphine eventually by himself and he just weaned himself off it. But apparently, like th those rumors aren't really correct. So we don't really know what happened. He could have just, you know, I don't know, made his own morphine. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, the point is that, like, uh, like the, all of the information on his morphine addiction just disappeared. So no one really knows what happened. Um, But, yeah, the point is that then onwards he lived in Ukraine. So he basically, as I said previously, he lived through um, the Civil War. And he also witnessed exactly 10 coups. It was a very difficult period for him because um, his sentiments were closer to the white guards, but not entirely. So obviously, I don't know how much you know about like Russian um, history. Um, I, I just know bits, so I'm just going to explain it as well as I can. So you obviously you had the Bolsheviks, so the communists. Then you had the Ukrainian nationalists. Um, they were a bit mental. Um, and then you had the white guards who were like supporting the Tsar. Now, so Bulgakov obviously, like, he hated the communists. He didn't have anything to do with them. He mocked their whole ethos, like, the whole concept of like ideal Marxist utopia it just didn't sit well with him. He didn't like any utopia in general. Um, so that wasn't for him. Then Ukrainian nationalists, they were absolutely mental and they killed a lot of people too. So he didn't like them either. But white guards, they were actually responsible for a lot of pogroms at the time. So they weren't the good guys either, but they were like, they were the best out of the three, if that makes sense. So there was a lot of going on and that, that actually really affected him mentally a lot because he just, you know... <laughs> He was a journalist and a writer, and at the time when Soviet Union was in charge, for example, you'll have a lot of censorship, so you had to write in line with the party's politics. So, if anything was even mildly steering away from the, you know, official um, party line, it wouldn't really be accepted. So, he had a lot of problems with that. A lot of his... Out of his books and of his plays, um, they were withdrawn. They were cancelled. He would he would get advanced for something. He would write it, and um, everyone would be like, "Oh yeah, yeah, this is fantastic. We can do that." Um, it would be out there for like a few days or weeks, and then it would be like, "Oh no, actually no, we don't like this anymore." And can we have the advance back, please? Terrible. So you can imagine why he kind of hated everything. So anyway. 1919, um, the guys, so you've got, I think you've got Ukrainian People's Army, so Ukrainian nationalists in charge. Um, so he's getting assigned to the Nor Northern Caucasus. Um, again, that was very difficult for him because he didn't like them, but he had to like, whoever was in charge, because he was a doctor, he had to just... He had just helped them, and he not he didn't necessarily agree with their um, with what they believed in. So very difficult. So 
Whilst he was at Northern Caucasus, um, he became ill with typhus. Um, he, he almost didn't survive. He literally almost just kicked it. So it wasn't really good for him. Um, so when he was there, that's when he started working as a journalist. Um, and then he was, so that was the time when he decided to maybe join the White Guards. So ma the major at the time, the majority of the White Guards decided to emigrate to Paris or something. Um, Bulgakov realized that it was extremely progressively um, more and more difficult for him to publish anything. Like the censorship was getting mad. So he was just like, well, I'm just going to join them. And I'm going to leave as well. Because, you know, he was the most associated with their causes and no one else's, so he might as well. So so he wanted to do that, but because he had ciphers, they didn't allow him, so he had to stay. Um, and now that obviously caused him a lot of financial issues again. Um, so, so that was also the last time he saw his family as well, so it was very difficult for him. Um, and even most of their, his relatives left Russia for Paris as well. So they managed to do that, but he didn't. Um, so you could imagine how difficult it was. Um, so at some point, I think he was like on the train or something. Um, and that was the first time when he wrote his first story. Um, he sent it, sent it off to the publisher. They were happy to publish it. Um, and that's, that's how he started with his more creative writing pursuits. Um, he was actually quite successful at that. Um, so that's what happened. Um, but then that's the thing. Um, uh, politics were very important in Russia at the time. So even the biggest um, theaters and other places, like there, all the cultural unions, um, they would give him some kind of protection. But if you weren't if you weren't writing what you were supposed to be writing, they wouldn't really like you that much. So, so a lot of um, directors from those theaters didn't really like Bulgakov because of the stuff he was writing. Now, Stalin felt a bit differently. Um, so, so Bulgakov wrote this play, right? It was called The Days of the Turbans. Um, that was absolutely loved by Stalin, weirdly. Um, he wrote, I think, so the rumor has it that Stalin actually went to see the play over 15 times. It's just a rumor, so who knows. Um, but yeah, so eventually it's getting worse and worse and worse for Bulgakov. He's, it's literally getting to the point where he, he gets an idea, he writes something, um, everyone's like, yeah, this is going to be great. Then he tries to publish it, nothing accepts it. He writes something else, n nowhere accepts it. Then someone someone finally accepts something that he wrote, and then they reject it, and it's just on and on and on and on. And it's getting worse because his reputation is suffering, because people know. So, <laughs> Bulgakov would all often write things that were very parallel to um, Soviet Union, and obviously, you know, they, they weren't mental. They, they realized that it was, you know, a satire. So, so they just wouldn't like him. Um, on top of that, he did actually, you know, right. If you're kind of stubborn, if you're like me, basically, um, and someone tells you what to do, and you really don't want to, but they force you to. And it's like, let's say it's someone who's got like authority and eventually you have absolutely no choice but to do that thing. You just do it in a very like vicious and stupid way where you just like exaggerate. So you like, so you do it overly proper just to piss them off. So <laughs> at some point, Bulgakov decided to do something similar. So he wrote this typical Russian propaganda book. Um, that was trying to like, oh yeah, this is great, White Guard's bad, Bolshevik's great, this is amazing. But it was so clearly satirical that everyone got it and he wasn't very successful with it either. So that wasn't very good for him. So eventually he gets so fed up that he basically sends a letter to Stalin. You know, an old buddy, oh, could you maybe... Could we maybe like, could you let me just leave? This is terrible, I've got no opportunities. Just just let me leave, I want to go. Um, 
So, I'm not sure, I don't think Stalin himself got back to, to him, but he did actually pull some strings and he got him a job at, um, as a director at, uh, I need to, uh, I need to rack my brain for this because I, I read it somewhere else. Um, MAT, I think, which was one of the, I may be wrong here, I think this was like one of the biggest like writers unions at the time. So he becomes the director. Um, so he's got a stable, secure job. So very good. He's got something to do. Now, yeah, so so yeah, so he rejoins the theater. Um, he and he starts working on a lot of adaptations. He's not very happy about it because obviously, you know, the time's ticking. He's getting older. Um, and he doesn't actually have a legacy, so it's getting very difficult for him. So, so he's trying and like Stalin again, uh, make sure that Bulgakov isn't getting arrested or executed, but it's still very hard for him to get his work published. So it's getting just worse and worse and worse. Um, eventually, um, his his worse his health's getting worse. He's had this weird form of sclerosis, like kidney sclerosis. Again, I'm, I'm not a doctor. I've got no clue what I'm talking about. Um, but it was like a her, her, hereditary um, disease that he got from his father, um, who died from the same thing. So it was like a kidney sclerosis, I think. I'll probably be able to um, verify that a bit later. Um, but yeah, so his health deteriorates. Um, so he starts to work on his legacy novel, which is Master and Margarita. So that he was working on, uh, so between 1937 and 1939, he was... Uh, he was just going absolutely mental. He was he he had those moments of like extreme optimism to like complete um, depression. It was going very bad. He was um, he was writing his he he wrote like the first draft of the novel and then he just just burned it because he knew that it's not going to get published. And you know it's it's just getting worse and worse and worse. And um, what I really wanted to bring up was that. He wrote a letter to his wife at some point in regards to Master Margarita, um, and so that's what he said on June on fifteenth of June, nineteen thirty-eight. Um, in front of me, three hundred twenty-seven pages of the manuscript, about twenty-two chapters. The most important remains editing, and it's going to be hard. I will have to pay close attention to details, maybe even rewrite some things. What is? What what's its future? You ask. I don't know. Possibly it will store the manuscript in one of the drawers next to my killed place, and occasionally I will be in your thoughts. Then again, you don't know the future. My own judgment of the book is already made, and I think it truly deserves being hidden away in the darkness of some chest. So he wasn't very optimistic about the future of the novel, um, especially when you look at the political climate. Um, in Soviet Russia at the time, it was just not going very well. So another rumor has it that in 1939, he organized a private reading of his of Master Margarita. He invited all of like friends and family, um, and supposedly he he finished the novel, reading the novel, and he said to everyone who was attending, when. He, <laughs> Well, tomorrow I'm taking the novel to the publisher, and everyone was terrified. You could imagine, like, if he was to literally take it to the publisher, he would be executed. It would really end very badly for him. So you can imagine why it was so difficult. So, you know, it just wasn't very good. So, eventually, Bulgakov, um... It gets his health gets worse and worse and worse. Eventually, he dies of that um, kidney sclerosis or something. Um, oddly, the writing group, like the MAT, um, they did a very dignified funeral for him, um, and he ended up with a gravestone from 
was it Gogol? It may have been Gogol. Um, I don't remember very well. But yeah, so he did have a very good death, I guess. Um, and you know, a few a, a bit more trivia about um, Bulgakov. Even he's even got a minor planet um, named after him. It's called Three Four Six Nine Bulgakov. Um, it was discovered by the Soviet astronomer uh, Lyudmila Georgievna Karachkina in 1982. So that's quite interesting. Um, also, you may have heard of Salman Rushdie before, who wrote Satanic Verses. Um, Master Margarita was actually an inspiration for the novel. So that was quite interesting. On top of that, one of the symptoms of syphilis was actually named after Bulgakov as well, <laughs> which you wouldn't really expect. Not because Bulgakov got syphilis himself, thankfully, um, more because when he was still a doctor, um, he was helping with, he was being a pediatric, pediatrician, um, the person who deals with feet, not children. <laughs> um, yeah, so because syphilis was so popular at the time, um, or more like pre prevalent, not popular, although, you know, who knows, um, he basically like diagnosed um, some specific sin uh, symptom that dealt with abnormal osteophytes in the bones of those worm-eaten-like appearance and creation of abnormal... No, wait. Pathological worm eaten like appearance and creation of abnormal osteophytes in the bones of those suffering from later stages of syphilis. So that was known as Bulgakov's sign. Um, it was used in Soviet states to diagnose syphilis, which is quite interesting. It's called, in the West, it's called the Bandy Lex sign. So if you've ever heard of it. Now, right, so. I'm going to leave the characters from Master Margarita to the next video, so I'm not really going to focus on that too much. Um, but it gets very interesting because, like, even the a lot of the elements from the book itself were taken from Bulgakov's experience in real life. So, for example, there's this very famous um, ball. Um, in the book, um, the spring ball of the full moon, where Margarita attends and um, Behemoth, the cat, offers her pure alcohol, um, which is quite a very funny quote, but we'll get there next week. Um, the point is, so Bulgakov actually attended um, a spring festival um, at the residence of the US ambassador to the Soviet Union. Now. So it was in the middle of the Great Depression, so obviously everyone was broke. Um, Stalin was also, you know, was doing very well with his repression too. Um, and, uh, and the event itself was mental. Like they went incredibly extravagant. Like they had decorations with like birch trees, they had uh, finished tulips, they had um, a lawn made of sugary grown on wet felt a fishnet aviary filled with pheasants, parakeets, and 100 zebra finches um, on loan from the Moscow Zoo. So they also had several mountain goats, a dozen white roosters, and a baby bear. Yeah, so, you know, that was a, quite a big scale, especially considering that they were in a Great Depression at the time. So Stalin wasn't there, but a lot of, like, you know, fancy elite people were actually were in attending. So you had Foreign Minister Maxim Litvinov, you had Defense Minister Clement Voroshilov, you also had like the biggest fish from the Communist Party, um, like uh, Bukharin, Kavganovich, um, then you had some Soviet marshals like Yegorov and Tukhachevsky and Budvani. Um, so a lot of people like this. Um, <laughs> I, I'm sorry, I'm actually reading this as 
like the, the, I'm reading this for the first time because I just knew like the details and I just like copied and pasted it to like to cover it during the video and it's just fabulous so apparently that you know that baby bear that he mentioned a minute ago so the bear became drunk on champagne given to him by Carl Radek who was one of like one of the uh, communist party um, big fish um, so yeah, and the zebra finches escaped from the aviary and perched below the ceilings around the house. So it was basically mental, you could say. Um, and on top of that, in 2010, 75 years after that ball, John Bale, I think, I think it's B-E-Y-R-L-E, -E, who's an U.S. ambassador to the Russian Federation hosted an enchanted ball at Spaso, Spaso House, recreating the spirit of the original ball as a tribute to Ambassador Bullet and Bulgakov. So that was a very famous ball, and the scene that describes it um, in Master Margarita is also extremely well done. Um, but you should read the book to find out because I honestly, it's it's worth it. Um, I am going to do deal a lot with on the all the themes and motifs and the book itself in the next um, in the next video. So you'll know quite a lot um, about the book by the time I'm finished with those two parts. Um, I just wanted to do a little bit of a setup on you know Bulgakov, his wife, his um, his writings, um, his early life too. And I think it's quite interesting. So yeah, um, Bulgakov was very. Uh, a very interesting um, character. Um, at some point, uh, he there was this photograph that they took of him where he was wearing a monocle, and he looked very dandified in the picture. So, so the press literally ripped him to pieces because they they called him a reactionary because of the way he looked. <laughs> so it was very odd, um, and obviously he was a bit more right wing. So he was going through a lot of issues. But he never compromised his values. That's the most important part. He didn't even want to leave the Soviet Union, but he couldn't. He physically couldn't. And again, I think the relationship between him and Stalin is very important because there's, even though obviously Bulgakov was, you would even you would be able to call him a nemesis of Stalin in a way. Um, yet they still had this weird symbiosis and they did work together very well like Stan would protect him and he would enjoy his place and you know Bulgakov did actually seek his approval to some extent so it was a very interesting um, thing between the two of them so yeah um, other than that he did try to write a futuristic novel um, where he would criticize utopias and um, that was pretty good um, and yeah, other in the Master and Margarita, he's also known for the White Guard and a few other titles that I mentioned before. The White Guard sounds really good because it's that's the most interesting thing, by the way, because the White Guard actually wasn't very, it wasn't accepted by, you wouldn't expect people, the communists, to accept that book. Our play, I think it was a play, our book, I don't know. Um, so it was basically covering the details of the Civil War, but from the White Guards perspective. But then it painted um, the White Guards as normal people that had their own problems, their own issues too. And surprisingly, the communists didn't actually hate it. They actually considered this a very interesting piece of writing, although obviously out of other communist critics did tear it to shreds, as happened with most of Bulgakov's writing. So he was a fantastic writer, but he couldn't get the recognition he deserved because of communism, because of you know because of the times he lived at, um, and eventually Master and Margarita. It's um, so. Bulgakov's last wife, he got married twice, uh, thrice, sorry. Um, his last wife um, and the second wife, they both advocated for his writings to be published and they did very well with his legacy. So eventually um, the book got published in the 70s, um, heavily, heavily um, 
censored, but it did. Um, obviously, you had the Samistad version, but we will get there next week. Um, but yeah, his legacy was actually taken care of by the people he loved. So, you know, in the end, maybe posthumously, but he did eventually get the legacy and the recognition he deserved. Um, he was a very cool guy. So yeah, that's everything for today. I wanted to keep it short and I don't want to um, go into too much detail. Um, next week, I'm going to talk about the book. I'm going to dive into all the themes and other things that are going to be probably interesting. Please, please, please like the video. That's going to make me so happy. Um, and subscribe if you haven't yet. That would also make me very happy. And if you wish to, you can donate to subscribe. Sorry, but that's up to you. Um, yeah, that's about it. I hope you'll enjoy this. And yeah, look forward to the next video next week. Goodbye.